All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Dissenter. My guest today is Dr. Diana Fleischmann from the University of Portsmouth. I hope I pronounced correctly Portsmouth yeah, because, because British people uh, don't take it lightly when you pronounce <laughs> the, the, the names of, of the places there incorrectly. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, she is my 41st guest now. So, the, this is going well, I think. And today we're going to talk about how the feeling of disgust affects men and women in different ways in terms of mate selection and their sexual behavior. And toward the end of, of this episode, and I hope we'll, we will also have time to do that, we will also talk a little bit about parent offspring convergence and divergence in terms of mate preference. So just to give you a quick introduction to Dr. Fleischmann, she completed a PhD in evolutionary psychology at the University of Texas under the supervision of the great, great David Buss, one of the pioneers of the field of evolutionary psychology. Well, th that must have been awesome. Uh, yeah. And, um, and now she is a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, as well as a member of the Comparative and Evolutionary Psychology group there. Dr. Fleischmann, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's a real pleasure to everyone. Okay, so uh, in psychology and particularly, I guess, in evolutionary psychology and social psychology as well, we talk about disgust. And there are several types of disgust. Uh, there, are, there is pathogen disgust, sexual disgust, moral disgust. Uh, are there any other types besides these three? And why is it important for, for us to distinguish between them in order to better understand human so socialization, let's say? Okay. So the taxonomy of disgust, this kind of idea that there's a moral uh, pathogen and a sexual domain, is pretty recent. So my colleague Joshua Tiber, who's now at uh, VU Amsterdam, he was the one who actually came up with this uh, questionnaire, and it's the three domains of disgust kind of survey. And it's even contested that there are three different domains of disgust. There are many people who say that there is actually no such thing as moral disgust. As, as, as it is. And some of the original measures of disgust had things like animal reminder disgust or body envelope violations. You know, our skin covers our whole body and obviously there are any kinds of disgust that, that if you have open skin that could be considered a separate type of disgust. So perhaps there are other kinds of disgust. We're not really sure. Some people would say that hygiene uh, concerns things about manners, things about foreigners, those kinds of things would be pathogen discussed. Some people say that they have their own domains. I have a colleague at, um, while well, we work together at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, he thinks that there are possibly more domains of disgust, but right now most people kind of work with this kind of three domain framework. So pathogen disgust helps us avoid potential contaminants, and the items on the questionnaire for that kind of thing are how would you feel if you stepped in dog poo? How would you feel if you saw a roach uh, crawling across the floor? How would you see if you saw, you know, feel if you saw, how disgusted would you feel if you saw mold on some food in your refrigerator? Whereas sexual disgust is considered the way that we avoid maladaptive kinds of attraction and mateships. So if somebody is attracted to you who you're not attracted to, they might be pursuing you, you might experience sexual disgust. If someone um, much older than you or of a, the sex that you don't prefer is attracted to you, you might experience sexual disgust. You might experience sexual disgust at certain kinds of sex acts. And I've been looking recently at the disgust of people across different sexual orientations. So one thing that's very interesting is asexual people, people who say that they experience no attraction for people of the same sex or the opposite sex, no attraction at all. And those people have higher sexual disgust than the rest of the population. They have very high sexual disgust, but they don't show higher disgust in the other domains. And moral disgust, as it's understood now, is this disgust that is used to coordinate people 
against moral transgressors and transgressions. So it's unclear if you really experience disgust when you see something, but the idea is that if you say that you feel disgusted, it's a better way of leveraging other people's emotions against the person who's transgressed, so you can punish them. And I was recently on a dissertation committee of a scholar named Thomas Kupfer, and he was interested in this kind of moral disgust idea, so he gave people a Nazi armband, and he said, you can either wear the Nazi armband under your shirt so that no one can see it, so it's against your skin, or you can wear it on top of your shirt so that everyone can see it. And people, you know, most people said they found Nazis very morally disgusting. And Paul Rosen had done some studies on this kind of thing before. And what he found was that most people wanted to wear the Nazi armband under their shirt when it would be in contact with the skin, as opposed to over their shirt where other people could see it. So even though they were disgusted, they weren't disgusted enough to want to keep the, the, the Nazi armband um, you know, in plain view at the risk at that risk. So those were the two kind of trade-offs that he made. Because, for example, Paul Rosen was saying, if I told you that, you know, a, a serial killer had worn a, a sweater or a jumper, then you wouldn't want to wear it. But it was never really able to choose one of these two competing hypotheses. Is it that you don't want to be in contact with it contaminating, or is it because you don't want to advertise that you might also be a Nazi, right? Or a serial killer or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And isn't it true that moral disgust, at least partially, has a sort of relationship with pathogen disgust? Because, I mean, uh, I, I've been reading some studies about how people, for example, in countries where there's a higher prevalence of the possibility of being infected by some sort of pathogen because there's a higher prevalence of infectious disease there, uh, they tend to be uh, less extroverted, less open to experience. They tend to be more politically conservative and things like that, right? Yes. So there is a lot of work now from a bunch of different people, but the two most well-known people that work on this are uh, Corey Fincher and Randy Thornhill. Uh, who uh, Corey Fincher's at uh, in, in the UK, and Randy Thornhill is at the University of New Mexico. And what they came up with is this pathogen scale where they look at each country and how much its pathogen burden is, and then they look at traditionalism. And their idea is that in a very highly pathogenic country or a region, it makes sense to be more traditional because those traditions keep out outsiders who could have new diseases. They make sure that you follow the cultural practices for preparing food, et cetera. And also, you just don't have as much kind of cognitive bandwidth, as much intelligence potentially, if you have a lot of parasites and pathogens. So it makes more sense to be conformist. These are some of the ideas around this. However, something very interesting is that the pathogen prevalence in a given area of, of a given population does not correlate with their disgust sensitivity. Hmm. And uh, Josh Tiber did a study where he looked at this uh, disgust sensitivity and political conservatism across many different cultures, and he finds that there's more political conservatism across countries when there is a greater pathogen load, I mean, there's more pathogens, but there's not greater disgust sensitivity. And that's a problem for some of these ideas. You know, one idea is that disgust evolved to keep us away from potential contaminants. And you do see that. If a picture shows cues of disease, that's going to be a more disgusting picture than a picture that doesn't show cues of disease. So we do find that aspect. But when it comes to kind of questionnaires, we don't actually see that someone's even, even their vulnerability to disease is necessarily that related to how they answer text items. And I don't want to get too into the weeds with this, but I wrote something recently about this. And uh, I did a study when I was in graduate school. My PhD thesis was on progesterone. And I looked at women's progesterone, which is thought to reduce their immune system's competence. So your immune system is more vulnerable when you have higher progesterone. So there's a period after ovulation and during the menstrual cycle when women have higher progesterone. And I said that you should expect to see women are more disgusted during this period. And another group, another laboratory said, we didn't find that effect. 
but I used pictures of disgusting things to measure that, and they used text, like how disgusted would you be to see moldy leftovers, whereas I actually showed pictures of disgusting things. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to go back and look and see if you actually see a difference in this when it comes to people rating pictures versus people rating text, because there might be something lost. If I ask you how disgusted would you be to see moldy leftovers, and if I showed you a picture, those two things might not have that much concordance. And that's the confusing thing about disgusted. It's very easy to make somebody feel disgusted with images, but it's not so easy with descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if you can talk specifically about this, but the structure of the brain that processes disgust, uh, and I'm not sure if it processes all three types of disgust or or only some of them, is the insula, right? Yeah, the right anterior insula. I started but never finished. I only ran one participant for an fMRI study for my dissertation. And it is the right anterior insula that is activated with disgust. But there's also a lot of other things that activate that area. And it does seem that disgust, you know, more than fear, for example, lights up more of the brain than it seems like disgust does. But I'm not an expert, yeah, on, the, on these kinds of brain regions. Uh, one kind of idea is that disgust is pretty evolutionarily novel. So other non-human animals don't really experience disgust. I used to work at a facility with chimpanzees when I was an undergraduate. I worked there when I was, whatever, um, 19, 20 years old. And the chimpanzees don't experience any disgust. They will handle their feces, they'll handle each other's feces, they really have no, no disgust at all. They're very curious about things that are, you know, growing mold and stuff. Uh, and they do tend to avoid a, another member of their group if they're diseased, but they also sometimes will beat them up, so they don't avoid them entirely, right? And so why, is something very interesting about disgust is that it is pretty human specific, I think so, and also that it comes very late in life. So if you ask children to make a disgust expression or to identify a disgust expression, it takes them longer to do that than other expressions. And children are about nine years old, which is very old, you know, for these kinds of emotions to come online before they can say, that's a disgust face or that's disgusting. Kids do mimic their parents a lot and they definitely have a fear of new foods when they're younger. But one idea, there's a couple of ideas. One idea is that disgust is very new, so it takes a while before we develop it because it's it's a complicated emotion. Another idea is that because humans live all over the world, we have to have a sensitive period where we will either learn what foods to like and what foods to avoid in a very in a given region. So there are, you know, I mean Jared Diamond talks about this in Guns, Germans and Steel, where there was a group of people, because they wouldn't eat fish, they died out because they, they started off somewhere else where fish wasn't eaten. They were in a, in a landlocked area. I don't, can't remember if it was Vikings. I think it was Vikings of some kind. And the, the remains show that they were eating their cattle until the, they were all gone. And they could have fished like people there did fish, but they were unwilling to do that because they were not in that culture where, where that was acceptable food. And so that's one thing about humans, why it might take a while for us to become sensitive to disgust, because as a toddler, you put tons of things in your mouth, and your mother tells you what's good to eat and what isn't good to eat. And if you become accustomed to eating certain things, then you're going to be well adapted for your area. But there's also a problem with that, right? It's sometimes difficult for older people to learn to like new foods. So, for example, my, my grandmother, she's 91, my German grandmother, she lost her sense of smell and taste. So she's got no, uh, she had a, a brain surgery and it incidentally lost her sense of smell and taste. She um, will not try new foods, even though she can't taste them. And many people are like that. They could have a healthier diet. And so that's one very interesting problem with disgust, is how it influences our food choices. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now to, foc to focus more on sexual disgust in particular. So I wanted to ask you what are the main sex differences in terms of how men and women deal with this feeling or this emotion that but but before that uh, j just for people to understand better wh where do uh, in what these feeling in what these ways of 
men, uh, that men and women process sexual disgust differently. Where do they stem from, these differences? Because, uh, I mean, uh, I guess that to start off with, we, we know that men and women have gametes we have who have different metabolic where who are um, metabolically uh, expensive um, yeah. for a woman it is more metabolically expensive to produce an egg than for men to produce sperm let's say mm -hmm. and and then from these uh, it is uh, they develop different optimal reproductive strategies and, and these uh, these are are at the basis of then of our sexual disgust then evolved in men and women, right? Very good, yeah, really good. Uh, so that's a really good kind of foundation. Yes. Um, how do we define male and female? Well, male and female are defined by gamete size, and some we're very very deep in the history of life. One sex specialized in making large gametes overall, another sex specialized in making small gametes. There are some species like fungus who have like 13 sexes, but in our species there are just um, two sexes. And uh, the female has the large expensive gametes and the male has the small, cheap, easy to produce gametes. And there is a principle, it's called Bateman's principle. And Bateman's principle is that males have more variability in their number of offspring than women do. So if you look at humans in particular, it's unclear how many offspring the man who had the most offspring ever had. You know, Genghis Khan had thousands of offspring. Something like 6% of everybody in China is descended from Genghis Khan. Whereas I think the woman who's ever had the most offspring, I think it was 54 or 60, something like that. Literally, I don't actually know how that happened. But anyway, so that's, that's the upper limit. And if you look at people in uh, more traditional kinds of societies, women really range in having between two and six offspring whereas men range between having zero and 50, right? There's a much bigger range. And so for men, they have a lot less to lose if they have sex than women do. So for a woman, she has a finite number of possible opportunities to pass on her genes, and each of them is very expensive, and she has to choose wisely as to who she's going to recombine her genes with. Whereas for a man, or for males in general, you see that they're very happy to take any sexual opportunity. In, for example, all of the different animals that we collect sperm from, like turkeys and, and cows and, and things like that, a turkey will try to mate with a, a ball that is suspended in the air. Like that is enough, that looks like a female enough for the male, right? And uh, you see this a bit in, in human men as well. Men are much less picky about short-term kind of sex than, than women are. So that's kind of one aspect of it. And sexual disgust is meant to prevent maladaptive kinds of sexual activity. So for men, there's a much smaller amount of sexual activity that's going to be maladaptive because most sexual activity, any chance that they have a shot at reproducing is going to be more adaptive for them than for women. So that's the first thing, is that kind of women is expensive to reproduce, men it's cheap to reproduce. Women have a finite number of shots. They want to mix their genes with the best possible mate who's going to invest. The other thing that's very interesting about the difference between men and women is that women are much more likely to get sexually transmitted infections than men are. So women, and this is there's no like delicate way of putting this, <laughs> women have basically a pocket, right? And men don't have a pocket, they have a penis. And you also see this in, in, um, in gay sex as well. The person who receives is much more likely to get diseases than the person who is the top, right? So what you see in men and women is that women have a much greater likelihood of getting a disease than men do, and they have a much greater disease burden. So they're much more likely to, for example, get chlamydia if they have sex with a man who has chlamydia. And also, if a woman has untreated chlamydia, there's a 20% chance that she'll become sterile she may experience pain for her whole life, whereas a man who gets chlamydia very rarely ever becomes sterile and often has totally no symptoms at all. If you look at something like HIV, if a man and a woman, if a man is HIV positive and he has sex with a woman, there's a, a uh, you know one in fifteen hundred chance that a woman will get HIV. If a woman is HIV positive, she has sex with a man who's not. There's a one in twenty five hundred chance that the man will contract HIV. So there's a huge difference, right? And 
we don't know how long sexually transmitted infections have been around, but if you look at this kind of effect where women, it's very expensive for them to reproduce, they have to be much choosier about their partners, and there's this extra burden of potentially getting diseases from their sexual partners, you see this conglomeration of reasons why women are more sexually disgust sensitive than men are. So there's a disgust sensitivity sex difference. Women are more disgust sensitive than men. Women are more, uh, you know, kind of morally uh, disgust sensitive in some ways. If you look at polls like Pew does, women think more things are wrong than men are. One very interesting thing that these polls have shown is that women tend to think abortion is more wrong than men do, which kind of goes against certain narrative as well. Um, women are more pathogen disgust sensitive than men, a bit, but the biggest sex difference is in sexual disgust sensitivity. Women are much more sexually disgust sensitive. They're much less likely to, for example, um, watch pornography. They're more likely to think that's disgusting. And this was an interesting topic, and this is a topic that, that I've worked on. So we were interested in how sexual arousal and disgust influence one another. So in men, there has been a study that shows that if men are sexually aroused, if you show men pictures of naked women, or you show them um, pornography, and then you say, how disgusted would you be, or would you be willing to do a variety of disgusting things? Either something, some sexual things, like would you have sex with an animal, right? Or other things, would you have sex with somebody who is 12? Would you have sex with a 60-year-old woman? Would you have sex with somebody who is obese? Or do you think it's sexy if a woman's peeing? This is a Dan Ariely study that he did as a small sample size, but there was a huge effect that sexually aroused men were more willing to do every sexual item. Another study that they looked at was sexually aroused men, how disgusted were they uh, listening to, you know, various, looking at various images and seeing various things. Men tended to be less disgust sensitive um, in, in those contexts. So we were curious if the same thing happened to women. Obviously, there's some disgusting things about sex that there's things that would, would not be disgusting in a sexual context that would be disgusting in everyday life, right? If somebody gives you a really wet kiss on the cheek, that's disgusting. But if your lover gives you a very wet kiss, that's not disgusting, right? There's, there's a difference in the context. So we were interested in whether or not sexually aroused women would think things were more disgusting. So I did a study with a colleague, uh, Lisa Don Hamilton, where we showed women pornography and then we showed them disgusting images. And we also measured their arousal. So we measured their arousal by measuring how much blood flow there was to their vagina with something called a photoplethysmograph. You could just call it the probe. And what we found is that uh, when women were sexually aroused, they didn't think things were less disgusting in our study. And interestingly, if you disgusted women before you showed them pornography, it took them much longer to get aroused and they showed lower overall arousal. So disgust also reduced sexual arousal in women. We don't know, there's no study that's been done in men on this. There's a group in the Netherlands that did something similar where they sexually aroused women and they asked them to do various different tasks. So one task was, um, they said, these are some used underwear. Could you throw them away? And they weren't really used. They were just sprinkled with coconut milk or something. But they, but they, they asked participants to do these tasks and they asked them to rate them on how disgusting they are. And in that study they found that women were less disgust sensitive about doing sexually disgusting tasks, like could you clean this vibrator or could you throw away this underwear? But other tasks, so they had 16 different tasks that they had them do, watching pornography for five minutes, doing two disgusting tasks again and again and again. And what they found was that, uh, that women were less disgust sensitive, slightly, in the, in the non-sexual disgust kinds of condition. So there is mixed evidence of that. I have a student who did his master's project with me. You can see it. His name is Florian Jacques. And we were interested in this possibility. So we did an online study. We said, women, either you run in place, I think that was a positive arousal uh, condition, or you watch pornography or you do nothing. Uh, oh no, or, or you watch a video of this couple, this attractive couple on holiday, right? And then we had them rate men's faces, and the men's faces were attractive or unattractive, and they either were made to look like they had a big rash, like a rosacea rash, or they were, made, they were like clean, they didn't have anything on their face. And we did not find that women who were aroused found men who had a rash on their skin more attractive. And we also didn't find that they found less attractive men's faces 
so we said, you know, would you like to kiss this guy? Or how disgusted would you feel to kiss this guy, hug this guy, and have sex with this, this guy? Either the attractive or unattractive, rash or no rash. And we didn't find any difference with aroused women. So it looks like, preliminary evidence, that for men, sexual arousal reduces their disgust sensitivity even more, and they already have much lower disgust sensitivity than women in the sexual domain. And for women, sexual um, arousal doesn't decrease disgust sensitivity. There's even one study that shows that sexual arousal can increase pathogen disgust sensitivity in women, which would, would make sense. So that's the mixture of evidence. Um, there's two articles that are on my website. One is a um, called Women's Disgust Adaptations, and the other one is Sex Differences in Disgust. It's very short, and it goes through all this evidence in, in really good detail. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you already touched touch a bit on this before, but uh, about the behavioral prophylaxis hypothesis. So uh, you, in this study you done with progesterone during the luteal phase in the menstrual cycle of women, uh, you were trying to establish an, an, an endocrinological basis for sexual disgust in women related to progesterone there, right? So uh, could you talk a little bit more about this? And I, I don't know if there's the same... Uh, there have uh, already been done some studies on men in terms of endo in endocrinology or not and, and related to sexual disgust. So my study that I did when I was at University of Texas at Austin for my dissertation did not look at sexual disgust. My colleague did look at sexual disgust in another study. So one idea is that when women are ovulating, they would experience greater sexual disgust because when you ovulate, you can get pregnant, and it's even more important that you have selective mate choice during that time. What I was looking at was sort of pathogen disgust. So I found an increase in pathogen disgust as measured in ratings to disgusting images when women were uh, in the luteal phase, which is that high progesterone phase. Now, a very big study has been done by Ben Jones and Lisa De Bruyne and some other people at Glasgow. I think it was something like 500 women. And they gave them the three domains of disgust scale, the sexual, the pathogen, and the moral domain. And they asked them uh, to come in multiple times during their menstrual cycle. And they measured their estrogen and they measured their progesterone. And they did not find that women who have higher estrogen showed more sexual disgust, as has been previously hypothesized. The, as I said before, the jury is still out as to whether or not we're going to see an increase in pathogen disgust in women of higher progesterone because there is a difference in terms of how it was measured. So I think, and there, I've seen another study on this as well, that women are going to show higher pathogen disgust when they're luteal if you measure it with pictures, whereas if you measure it with text. But that's still, still the jury's out on that. We're going to be collecting data on that in the fall. So the behavioral prophylaxis hypothesis which I wrote about this in a recent commentary, you can also find that on my website, uh, is, is contested. So it's, it seems to be very sensitive to how you measure the disgust sensitivity. So for example, they did a study looking at men who were addicted to cocaine and men who are not addicted to cocaine. And men who are addicted to cocaine have a lot more infections and they have worse immunological profiles, obviously, because their, um, their bodies are being uh, you know, they're, they're stimulated to the point where their immune system is exhausted. That's my, my spin on it anyway. And so w what, they did, what they found is that when they looked at pictures, they just showed more latency when it came to like disgusting pictures. So that's all the evidence they found. Another study found that they looked at people shortly after they had had a flu or a cold. And it's called a, it's called a dot probe task. So what they do is they show you a dot, then they show you a picture of somebody, you know, disfigured, like they showed a, a face that was disfigured. And then they said, you know, you have to point out the dot in another quadrant. And so they said people who had recently been sick were more distracted by this face that was disfigured, indicating potentially this idea that uh, when we're immunologically vulnerable, we're more sensitive to possible cues of disease in our environment so that we can avoid them. But when it comes to just simple disgust sensitivity, like how disgusted do you feel seeing some moldy leftovers in your refrigerator, the evidence is really not very clear cut. So I'll just have go a quick aside here. 
people often say evolutionary psychology is unfalsifiable, right? And here I'm talking about all the different nuance in our research and about all the different people who are saying, look, we studied this with 500 people, we didn't find the effect, you only see the effect in this condition or that condition. So it's really unclear if the behavioral prophylaxis hypothesis, which is what I did my whole dissertation on, is true at all. It might not be, but we're still looking at the data on that. Mm -hmm. Another hypothesis behind the difference between men and women in terms of pathogen disgust are also the fact that uh, dur during our evolutionary history, men had to go hunt and also they participated more than women in warfare and things like that. So uh, those are other hypotheses on the table to try to explain differences in pathogen disgust, right? I have mixed feelings about that idea. So on the one hand, yes, men were butchering animals, but women also butchered animals. And if you think about a woman's day-to-day -day life, taking care of children is in many ways more disgusting than going on a hunt, <laughs> right? Children do lots of disgusting things. I, I actually looked at this idea with one of my students, again, uh, interesting hypothesis. I was curious if if you felt something was cute, like if I showed you lots of cute baby faces, would that subsequently lower your disgust sensitivity? Because babies and disgusting things often go together, right? There's a very funny uh, YouTube video of men gagging while they're changing their baby's nappies, you know, whereas women don't, don't really tend to do that. So I don't think that men and women had differences in how disgusting their like day-to-day -day lives were over the course of history. Yeah, killing other men might be you know, quite disgusting, but I don't think disgust is the main barrier to killing other people. I think that they, they don't want to be killed is the main barrier to killing them. Um, in terms of the other question that you asked me, what was it that uh, sex differences in disgust? It really just shows the biggest difference in the sexual domain, and so I think it has more to do with uh, the, the differences in how to produce offspring and the differences in, um, um, yeah, sexually transmitted infections. In terms of taking care of offspring, yeah, there's some ideas that a woman had to show her baby how, you know, what things to avoid and what things to eat. So women might be very specifically inclined to be disgust sensitive so that they could demonstrate those things to their offspring. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure about that entirely. Women are more facially expressive than men are. And there was a study that came out recently with a really big sample that showed that uh, women are much better than men at detecting disgust faces as opposed to fear, happy, sad, where there doesn't really seem to be much difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, okay, so we've been talking about sexual disgust and other types of disgust, and this obviously influences mate selection. And another interesting aspect related to mate selection, and that you've also studied, is parent-offspring convergence and divergence in terms of mate preference, because there's a conflict, uh, usually there's a conflict between, at least in certain aspects, between the parents and their offspring when it comes to the mate, their, the offspring prefers to, uh, or the person, the offspring prefers to be their mate, their sexual mate. So uh, what are the main aspects in which you found the divergence between how parents and offspring evaluate their, their potential mates? So I did this research a while back with my colleague Karen Perilou, and I haven't kept up with the research as much. There's a guy named Menelaus Apostolou, obviously a Greek guy, who uh, has done more of the recent research on it. So I'm not 100% up to speed, but in our study what we found is that men and women are very much differently treated by their parents. So girls are much more, uh, we called it the daughter guarding hypothesis. And what we said is that young women, they're more likely to have a curfew, which is when they have to come home. They're much more likely to have their parents control what they wear. They're not going to be as likely to be allowed to work outside the home. You know, even in Texas, which is, you know, traditional in some ways and not traditional in others. You know, we're talking about um, how I'm half Portuguese. I mean, my mother obviously is a, was a daughter to her parents, and she was very, very carefully controlled by her parents. 
when she was a teenager too. And that's often something that I see um, in Portugal as well. So my mother, I think that she had that kind of attitude towards me as well. So I was much more tightly controlled than my brother was, and he was younger than me. He never had a curfew, not ever. And I had a curfew until I was 17. So that is, you know, one aspect is that perhaps parents want to evaluate their daughter's mates more. They maybe don't want to be on the hook if, if their daughter chooses to who doesn't actually invest in their offspring, so parents might not want to be raising their daughter's offspring for them. But we also found potentially, you know, one idea is that uh, the status of the parents is actually involved in their daughters. So we found that mothers actually care a lot about their their kids' mate choice, whether it's a son or a daughter. But fathers really only care about their daughter's mate choice, and they don't really care about much about their son's mate choice that much. So we didn't actually find huge differences. If I recall correctly, I think we found things like, you know, the parents cared more if the their son or daughter was with somebody who was religious. It seemed like they had some traditional values. But I think both parents and offspring were aligned in a lot of their ideas about what makes a good mate. They want somebody healthy. I think that kids were more interested in having a mate, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that had an exciting personality. And their parents didn't care as much about that. So that's some of the aspects that were uh, that we found, and the f original studies done on this were in a group that's been studied on an island called Dominica, and on Dominica, uh, this guy named Flynn was noticing that oftentimes fathers would threaten th their daughter's suitors with violence, and so we were curious if that was something you know that kind of control was something that also happened in uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, bo both parent and offspring mate preferences usually track or go along with the, pref the traits that men and women prefer in the opposite sex, according to the evolutionary psychology literature. Yeah, I think that they, I, I, there wasn't really big differences, uh, as far as I remember. I think that there was just... They, they cared, the parents really only cared very much that the, the, the mate was more dependable and they didn't care as much about whether they were exciting. And so, you know, one thing that's interesting about human mate choice throughout history is that we've been studying mate choice kind of with the impression that people have been free to choose their own mates for a long time. But we actually don't know if that's true. In many cultures, women really have very little say in who they end up with. And men also don't have that much of a say about who they end up with. And there's a lot of ideas in evolutionary psychology that we're slowly learning more about. So a lot of these ideas about how women's psychology changes at ovulation were dependent on the idea that women seek out extra pair mates, that they look for other men to father their offspring other than their main partner. But the rate of extra pair paternity, that is the rate at which women have sex with men outside of their primary mateship. So a guy raising his a kid that he thinks his head is, is somebody else is very low in most places. Uh, less than 1%, 3% at the most. But what's very interesting, and I don't know if anybody's written about this, but there's a Twitter feed, or sorry, a Twitter thread about this. Uh, this one woman said that she has looked at the Himba, which are a tribe in Africa. And in the Himba, the extra pair paternity rate is much higher, something like 50%. And in that uh, group, the women are arranged in marriages. And so I think one interesting avenue of future study would be to see, do women in arranged marriages actually go outside of their relationship more often to conceive children? And that might make sense because they might not be allocated or told to have the optimal mate, somebody that they're really excited about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'm starting to get mindful of your time now. So uh, just before we finish, w would you like to tell people perhaps some interesting piece of work you're doing at the moment and also share with them where they can follow your work and your social media and things like that? Yeah, um, so I'm here at the University of Portsmouth and right now I'm working on some stuff about how well people understand each other's preferences. So something I'm interested in is how well people control each other with either rewards or punishments. So the idea is that we are all 
innately or instinctively actually behaviorists. I have behavior that other people do, and if I want them to do that behavior, I can reward them, or if I don't want them to do that behavior, I can punish them. And the idea is that it's all unconscious. So right now, I am looking to write a book, potentially, about how this all happens. Uh, and it's going to be a popular book, but I'm also interested in doing more theoretical work on that. Another thing that I'm looking at is I am looking at people of different sexual orientations and their disgust sensitivity. So I'm writing up um, something on that at the moment. And there's other kinds of um, sort of incipient sort of projects. But if you want to see all my publications, and there'll probably be more stuff coming at some point, um, you can see me at dianafleischman.com. Another thing that I'm really into that everybody should check out is a movement that's called Effective Altruism. Effective Altruism looks at how to do the most good with your money. So, for example, uh, you can spend very little money. For example, uh, in Africa, a malaria net will keep somebody um, from having malaria for a year. Potentially $3,000 of money can save a life whereas in the developed world it's much more expensive um, to save a life. And there's a variety of different causes that effective altruists look at. So one cause that I'm associated with is animal activism. So there's obviously billions and billions of animals, maybe a trillion fish and something like um, yeah, tens of billions of animals killed every year in really horrific ways. And that's one way that it's very easy to reduce suffering. So I uh, work I'm on the board for a think tank called Sentience Institute that looks at that kind of stuff. And I would just tell everybody, as I always do in these kinds of conversations, if you eat meat, you can become 90% vegan. You can reduce the number of days of suffering that you cause per year. If you switch from eating uh, chicken and fish and eggs, switch to eating beef. So whenever you think about ordering chicken, order beef or pork instead because they're much larger animals and you kill far fewer animals per year if you stop eating chicken. So if I can convince anybody to do anything, don't eat chicken anymore. And you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Sentientist. I uh, am generally on there every day, but I haven't been lately. And Sentientist is, also has to do with sentience, the idea that we should be interested morally in organisms that have sentience as opposed to just humans, for example, or just prioritizing organisms morally based on their intelligence or how they can benefit us. So that's, again, sentientist, or check me out on dianafleischman.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And by the way, just for you to know, I interviewed JC Rees oh, uh, oh. a week ago, so I, I will be releasing the interview perhaps in a few weeks or so. Uh, I will let you know when it is out. And Dr. Fleischman, do, uh, Dr. Meatman. <laughs> Uh, I, I, uh, I would like to thank you for taking a bit of your time to being here with us today again. Uh, I think it was a great conversation. And so uh, when this interview is out, I will, let you, I will let you know. And okay, I think it's all. It was great. Thank you, Ricardo. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. If you appreciate my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. Thank you.